Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, uh, if you were here last week, we, we talked a lot about the law part of the law and gospel. We talked about how the primary purpose of the law is not, not to show us how to live, but it's actually there to convince us we can't possibly live the way that God asks us on our own. And that's the thing about the law. On the outside, it almost looks possible. But the more you run at that law with your, your full might, the harder you try at it, the more you, you dig in and understand what God's law asks, the more it becomes patently obvious that it is hopeless. That is a good thing to recognize. Because only when we have given up hope in ourselves are we then ready to hear the gospel, the good news, literally. The good news that Jesus kept the law, that Jesus did the law in our place, that he then lived, died, and rose to give that gift to us. See, we're not held to the law anymore. We are forgiven. We are made right before the judge. We are set free, free from the demands of the law. We're free. Free from the punishment of sin and free now to live forever with God in heaven. And that's the freedom that we're going to be looking at this morning. To understand the freedom a little better, though, we, we need to dive back a little more into what the slavery was like. Friends, do you remember your life before Jesus? I, I'll be honest, I don't. <laughs> um, I was born in the church. I was baptized as an infant. I was raised by Christian parents. I don't remember life before Jesus. I have, however, had times, probably in youth, right? Times when I drifted, when I strayed a little too far from the path, and I remember what that was like. Without Jesus at the forefront of your life, there's the, the constant feeling of being incomplete, that something's missing. You see it in people all the time, right? Everybody's always trying to fill that feeling with something. Some people fill it with vices. Some people fill it with work. Some people with family or friends or experiences. But whatever they try to fill that feeling with, they always need more because that, that feeling is never sated. Because that hole is caused by the guilt of the conscience. No matter how many worldly things you indulge in, the guilt doesn't go away. No matter how much you struggle to do better, you still understand fundamentally you haven't done enough. There's an almost certain feeling in every one of us that, that you're going to have to answer for what you've done someday. You may not even know who it is you're going to have to answer to, but it's there. And, and maybe then you end up trapped in that, that guilty pattern of, of self-recrimination, self-loathing, and, and it ends up hurting you and, and those around you. At worst, you end up trying to drown out that voice, and you try to convince yourself that eh, you're, you're going to be okay anyway. Maybe you've never experienced that in your life. I'm, I'm glad for that. But that is the destructive cycle that we are now set free from. That's what we don't have to live. We have learned the truth about the slavery we live in and the truth about our God 
that we were accountable to. The law has made us understand that there is no amount of getting ahead in this life that makes a difference. None of that lasts, none of it's going to affect the outcome on the other side. We've learned that there's no amount of of well-intentioned effort that makes a difference. Our conscience is very clear. We have not measured up, and we cannot correct the situation. And so we do the only thing we can do. We throw ourselves on God's mercy. And God, though we have given him no reason to do this, he comes and sets us free. He died in our place. He bore the punishment we deserved. And we are free from the slavery of this life. We are, we are released from the burden of needing to work to make God happy with us. God loves us. God has forgiven you through his actions, not ours. Nothing we do makes him love us more or less. Our eternal destination is a fact because of him, not because of us. We, he will take us home to be with him. We're free from from nagging worries in this life then that that we won't measure up. And knowing that, having that truth firmly embedded in us frees us in a lot of other ways too, doesn't it? It frees us from pressures to need to, to do or to accomplish great things while we are here in this life. It frees us to be happy when we go without because we recognize that our greatest reward is coming. And when that reward comes, when we get the fulfillment of God's gift to us, there's not going to be regrets. Not going to be regrets in heaven about we, what we didn't get to while we were here. In Christ, we are truly free. It is in that state of mind, this this presence of true gospel freedom, that Paul wrote this section of Galatians we're reading today. From Galatians chapter 5, he says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The word of our Lord. That's a a big section, lots in there. I think ultimately the question we have to ask ourselves is, what do we do 
with this freedom that has been given to us as a gift? Or, or maybe more to the point, what does this freedom truly mean? To understand it properly is, is a great release for the Christian. It leads to all kinds of blessings and joys. To misunderstand it instead is not only to welcome hurt and tragedy into your life, it also actually risks a return to the death sentence we were once under. Um, we're not going to be able to cover it all today, friends. Christian freedom can be a complicated issue, especially given how much Paul wrote about it through his letters. But that, that I think, just makes it all the more important that we understand it properly. Maybe it's better to begin by discussing what that freedom isn't, as Paul says here. He, he first says, you are free, don't let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That may seem like a duh statement, right? But he goes on to, to describe how that could happen so we, we can recognize it. I don't think anyone else, or I don't think anyone here is, is foolish enough to be like, oh, I'm free. Hey, slavery, sign me up, right? It's often far more subtle than that. And, and we can't avoid it if we don't understand how it comes to us. The, the next statement in, in verse 13 there, it illuminates for us some. He says, we are called to be free, but it is not a freedom that indulges our sinful nature, or, or as he says, the flesh. That's the first big turnabout in thinking in what, in what freedom in Christ is not. Maybe that's obvious, but I also think it's the first stumbling block that we all face with our Christian freedoms. Because as, as Americans, what do we think freedom means? If, if somebody asks you, what does it mean to be free? I, I, I'd wager, right? I'd wager the typical answer is something, well, I'm free to do what I want. Can anyone here remember what it was like the, the first time they were left home alone to take care of yourselves the uh, first couple times? I mean, let's, let's not be too noble here. <laughs> I know what it was like for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay up late. I'm going to watch stuff with the volume turned up. I'm going to have pizza and chips and candy and soda. I'm going to totally indulge. All that stuff mom won't let me do. Now, never mind, retired for school the no next day or you're, you're damaging your hearing or destroying your nutritional balance. It's in our nature to be selfishly short-sighted whenever we are given the option to choose for ourselves. Eventually, hopefully, we grow, we learn that there are consequences to acting like that. I, I can't quite do that like I used to in my youth. My, my point is, it's in our nature to want to act just the same with the freedom Christ won for us, to use it to indulge. Paul warns us not to indulge the sinful nature. And, and if you're not aware, I want you to try to burn this thought into your head. The defining characteristic of the sinful nature is selfishness. When you indulge the self with the freedom Christ won, that is not freedom at all. It is returning to the slavery that we were under before. It's so returning to the life of sin that we couldn't get ourselves out of. And doing that only hurts yourself and hurts others. But this isn't a, a, the, the hurt you get like the stomach ache after a day of eating a whole pint of ice cream. This is the kind of hurt that could actually kill. You look at Paul's list of all those sinful acts, the, the acts of the sinful nature, and then look at what he says at the end of that section. He says, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I, I want to be very clear on this point because I don't want to needlessly panic or scare anyone either. 
he phrases this very carefully. He is not saying this about people who fall into sin through weakness. No, he says it's those who live like this. Those who choose to indulge the sinful nature in this way will not have eternal life. You cannot choose to make all of those awful things your life and still expect to be saved. Now, you might want to say, okay, but forgiveness. Jesus paid for those sins too. Maybe that even confuses you. I I thought what we did was forgiven. I thought there wasn't punishment for sin. I thought we weren't under the law. So how can you say that those who live like this aren't going to be saved? Well, let's let's examine that logic because it does come out. The reasoning of the sinful nature would say something like this. The law has been met. Sins, future, past, paid for. So I am free now to do whatever I want. Yes, that is true. But the crux of the whole matter comes down to those last few words. What I want. What is it you want to do with your freedom in Christ? You see, freedom in Christ is freedom from the sinful nature. It is freedom from that old self that was built into us from birth, that old self that hates God, that cannot do what God wants, that can only act selfishly, and it's that nature that got the death sentence in the first place. If what you want to do with your freedom in Christ is indulge that nature, then you've gone back to slavery. You are no longer free. And again, I'm I'm talking about those who, who choose to live that way, not the sins of weakness. We all have those. Friends, when we come to faith in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are given a new heart. We are given a new self by God. And that by God's strength, that new self, that new heart can overpower the old nature still in us. The defining characteristic of that new self is that it is the opposite of the old nature. The new self exists in selfless love. If you ask the new self, what do you want to do? The new self wants to think about others. The new self wants to put God first. What the new self wants most is to not want anything for itself. Brothers and sisters, Only that new creation inherits eternal life. If that old nature manages to take control, you're lost. Right now, here on this earth, we have both. We have both within us struggling for dominance. And I know firsthand how much that can feel like a struggle. It can feel like it could go either way. But I want to tell you something. It's not even a contest. I'm a fan of superhero movies. I don't know if you are or not, but I love them. I gobble them up. You know, oftentimes in a superhero movie, especially like an origin story, when the hero first gets their powers, they often stumble across some random crime on the street, maybe a mugging, you know? And and you've got these two street-level thugs against a superhero. You know how it's going to turn out, right? You're just there to see them show off their new powers for the first time. Friends, that's, that's how it is between the power of God within us and that old nature. The old self has no real power. The new self is powered by God 
himself. That new nature will win as long as you stay connected to God's power. You stay connected to the source of the power God has promised you, which is his word and his sacraments. God will feed you through his word and sacraments. God will give you the strength you need. That is how God will overcome for you. And in that, you stay free. And the new self follows God as its pattern. The God that loved us when we were unlovable. The God that gave everything to rescue us. The new self makes us the way God always meant for us to be. And in doing so, when we live that life through his power, the fruits of the Spirit are poured out in our lives. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's freedom. That is also service to God and to others. Friends, I would much prefer that to serving myself. You have been set free by God. It can be tempting to want to return to serving yourself but by the power of our Savior, we don't ever need to be trapped in that again. Stay close to God because it's his power that allows you to live free. And in that freedom, serve your God and serve your neighbor. Not because you have to. Not because it gets you a reward that you don't already have. Do it because in Christ, that's just who you are. It's just what you want. It really is true freedom to serve. Amen.